why do we have to go to school? <laughs> That's probably a question that everybody has asked their parents or will be asked by their kids at some moment or another. I was seven, I think, when I asked that to my mom in tears. I was in tears, not my mom. The reason for my tears was not that I hated school, because I didn't, but that it, that had, it had just dawned on me, dressed to go to school, in the middle of house cleaning day, furniture upturned, in the havoc just before getting in the car. I remember suddenly bawling my eyes out, tears rolling down my cheeks, dripping on my uniform, because it had just dawned on me that everybody dies in the end. So why bother? So my poor mom had to deal with a seven-year-old having an existential crisis smack in the middle of a school day. She did really well and avoided the whole part about going to school and just focused on the part about how, yes, we all die in the end. But until then, I get to enjoy being alive and knowing you and knowing your dad and making you happy and being happy that I can make you happy. And that makes life worth it, even if we die in the end. So that worked keeps working to this day. I took a deep breath, went to school. 20 years of it. And I learned some things along the way about what brains are made of and what human brains are made of and how we compare to other species. And unexpectedly, I realized that in the process, I had also learned something about the real reason why we have to go to school, which I bet is not the reason your parents told you. So I'm here today to trouble you with that question. Why do we have to go to school, every single one of us? And what could that possibly have to do with what I learned about what the human brain is made of? Let me start with this, and this is key. I learned that human brains are not special. If you take a brain, separate its parts, slice and dice them, then crush them in detergent and turn them into soup, you can very easily go to the microscope and count how many neurons the brain was made of. I've done that with hundreds of brains of all sorts of species, birds and mammals, cats and dogs, mouse and elephant, and humans too. All of them have a cerebral cortex, the part of the brain that's responsible for finding patterns, for using past experiences to make decisions, planning ahead. All of those cortices are made of a very predictable number of neurons, the building blocks that make brains, the units of information processing. It turns out that primate brains like ours are different from other mammalian brains in that more neurons build the primate cerebral cortex of a certain size. So between a primate and any other mammal with cortices of the same size, the primate always has more neurons. Primates may even have more neurons if the cortex is smaller than others. A giraffe cortex has about 1.7 billion neurons. A monkey cortex is smaller, but also has 1.6 billion neurons. The African, the African co elephant cortex, twice the size of ours, has only 5.6 billion neurons, whereas ours has 16 billion neurons. It's the cortex with the most neurons of them all. We have the most neurons in the cortex, not just because we're special, but because we have a primate brain, and the largest one at that. Most mammals have fewer than one billion neurons in the cortex. We only find more in very large mammals or in primates. Lots of cortical neurons cost lots of energy, but the human cortex costs just as much energy as it should for its number of neurons. It also takes just as long to develop and mature as you could expect for its number of neurons. Now, because we're animals, lots of energy require lots of time spent eating. That is why elephants have to spend nearly every waking hour eating. That's 18 out of 21 hours per day. Elephants can do that because they only sleep two to three hours per day. Because primates like ourselves spend around nine hours lying in bed, the most they can spend eating is about eight and a half hours per day. If that's not enough, they lose weight. If our ancestors ate the same way as other primates, but had as many neurons in the brain as we have now, it would have had to spend over nine and a half hours per day eating, which is clearly not feasible. 
Just think of your lives and what you have if you had to do that. Forget work, forget building cities, forget going to school, much less debating why we should do it. With our primate biology, if we ate like other primates do, we could not be here. So if it's so expensive to have lots of cortical neurons, how did we do it? It turns out that we are the only species that extensively modifies their food before they eat. Everybody else is limited in how many neurons they can afford in the cortex because they eat their food pretty much as is in their raw state in nature, with few modifications, if any. But our ancestors, already bipedal and with grasping hands, developed a cheat when they still had brains about one-third the size that we have today. A cheat that allowed them to escape that energetic wall that still applies to every other species on Earth. That cheat, that trick, was a technology. Stone tools that our ancestors could use to cut, pound, crush, mince, essentially to pre-digest their food before putting it in their mouth. Stone tools were probably our first attempt at technology. Cooking with fire was a technology that came later. Technology, according to my favorite definition, is any object, process, method, or knowledge whose application helps solve a problem faster and allows new problems to be tackled. So by definition, technology buys you time. And cooking technologies, even those as simple as stone tools and knives and later fire, do exactly that. They solve the problem of ingesting enough calories in a limited number of hours. And once that's done, a large number of neurons becomes affordable when they weren't before. And there now is time left to use those neurons. And being able to afford a much larger number of neurons, especially the really expensive ones in the cerebral cortex, must have been an enormous advantage because, by our estimates, that number of neurons tripled in record time under two million years. And so, some 200,000 years ago, humans already had a body and brain size that they have today, which implies that they already had the same number of neurons in the cerebral cortex that we have today but they were nowhere close to doing all that we do today. The difference is that cognitive capabilities are not abilities. Our capabilities come from the number of neurons in, this, in the cortex, the part of the brain that allows us vertebrate animals to do much more than just detect and respond to stimuli, adding flexibility and complexity to behavior. The rest of the brain is perfectly capable of operating the body, but the cortex receives a copy of everything that's going on in the rest of the brain, which gives us a chance to store and combine all that information, to use the results of previous experiences to make informed decisions, to even plan for the future. It is thanks to the cerebral cortex that we can act today with an eye on tomorrow based on information that doesn't arrive through the senses because it only exists in our heads as concerns or wishes, as hopes or dreams. Neurons are the building blocks of the brain, much like Lego pieces, except that these are Lego pieces that process information and chug lots of energy in the process. So it costs a lot of energy to have a lot of neurons in the cortex, but the more the neurons that a species can afford in the cortex, the more the information it should be capable of processing. Just like there are many more and more complex shapes that can be built with a large pile of Legos that, than with a small bunch of them. And this is where it gets interesting. Because it's one thing to specify how many building blocks or Lego pieces a brain will be made of, and even the general order and shape in which they're going to put, be put together, but it's another thing entirely to specify exactly how each of those 16 billion neurons will be connected to maybe 10,000 or 100,000 other neurons each. And that is where our abilities come from, from exactly how those neurons are wired. The 10,000 or so genes that are expressed in the brain are obviously enough to specify roughly how many Lego blocks a species gets. But to determine exactly how they are wired, that requires information that is not in the genes. Just think of building with Legos. 
with 54 Legos, you can put together a Star Wars headhunter spaceship. If you have, if you have 1,359 blocks, you can assemble a Star Wars Imperial Star uh, Destroyer. The instructions to, in how to put the 54 pieces together into a headhunter spaceship fit in one single page. But the instructions to assemble the Imperial Star Destroyer fill three booklets, nearly 200 pages. So imagine how long the instructions would have to be to specify the assembly of a human cortex with 16 billion parts and each one of something in the order of one quadrillion connections among those parts. No biological plausible amount of genes could hold that. And that is a wonderful thing. The brain doesn't come with preset assembly instructions beyond the general instructions for the basic uh, shapes. Instead, it has a biological remarkable property called self-organization. In the case of the brain, self-organization is a property of neurons in circuitry to change and become shaped and patterned according to how they are used. It is a process very much like carving a rough block of granite that isn't anything meaningful yet, but holds infinite possibilities inside it, into a beautiful, personalized sculpture that holds great meaning to the viewer. Except that in the case of the brain, this is a sculpture that shapes itself. It shapes itself as some connections get stronger and permanent as they show themselves to have meaning, to contribute to something interesting or useful, and other connections are weakened and even removed, like excess granite that contributes to the final shape as it gets carved out. So this self-organizing network gets shaped as it assimilates information from the environment, from how the network is used, from, how, from what turns out to be useful or not. It gets shaped as it learns, it learns as it is shaped. It is this carving from an excess of raw material, from an excess of neurons and connections in early life, that shapes our biological capabilities into great abilities. And this is where schooling comes in. As the pile of neuronal Legos and thus the information processing biological capabilities of our ancestors increased, so must have increased the range of problems that they could become interested in and could solve. And with that growing experience, must have increased the number of technological solutions and the repertoire of each individual, be those solutions, bits of information, or bits of stones or bones shaped just right. With enough neurons, a cerebral cortex capable of seeing solving, solvable problems around it starts coming up with the technologies to solve them. And those technologies, those ideas and processes to shape objects and mental algorithms to approach problems and take them on, those technologies start shaping the brain itself as they get used. As they shape the brain, those technologies become assimilated into the brain, into our abilities, which lead to ever more te technologies. Each and every individual has this capacity to learn, to shape its brain through use. But even more important, with enough neurons in the cortex, we humans begin to realize how we can also transmit the, the technologies that we each come to assimilate in our brains to other brains around us. We realize that we can do that by example, but we can do it even better once we notice that breaking down the process into smaller bits makes it easier to be transmitted to other brain, little by little, systematically, achieving ever-increasing levels of complexity, both in what we can do and in what can get passed on. And that is teaching. And it turns capabilities into abilities. Teaching becomes all the more important in human evolution because through generations, as humanity develops ideas and passes them on and learns even more, we quickly get past that point where each of us can or should figure out everything by ourselves. We have long reached that level where no single human brain can any longer hold all the information, all the technology that our species has accumulated. Humanity has long transcended the individual brain. The 16 billion neurons in our cortex made us human, 
But that was 200,000 years ago to make us modern humans capable and able to make decisions and plans that are informed by our past, by our current reality, and by our hopes and fears for the future, each individual brain has to be educated anew, has to be exposed to the systematic transmission of all the know-how and know-what that our species has been accumulating over the years, has to be shaped by the brains that came before us so that the modern brain and its abilities in the modern world emerge and live on. And it doesn't stop there. Just like neurons are the Lego pieces that build brains, we can think that our individual brains are the Lego pieces that build human societies. And society, like the brain, is a self-organizing system. Like the brain, it has the potential to turn into anything. But what it actually becomes depends on how its parts are shaped through education and how they function together. So that is why we have to go to school and why we need an ever-increasing number of people to go to school for ever-increasing lengths of time, so that each of us gets a chance to have all those cognitive abilities that we prize so much be shaped from our biological capabilities, so that the knowledge, the know-what, and the technology, the know-how, that define modern humanity get to live on in the brains of enough people and continue to grow in future generations. And that is why I'm in awe of cooking and technology as a whole, but I am also in awe of teachers, instructors, professors, mentors, anybody who contributes to shape the brain of others and helps them develop their biological capabilities into actual abilities. Writers of science fiction have done for us the mental experiment of estimating how quickly we would be left with pure, unfulfilled potential if we were to lose what those who came before us learned, if we were left to our own biological devices. All that it takes is one generation that doesn't get to go to school. It's easy to get caught up wondering at the, how the biology of the human brain is remarkable and take all the rest for granted. It's easy to forget how we absolutely depend on other people being willing to put effort into teaching us, into passing on their knowledge to shape our brains. It's too easy to forget how it is up to us to use our brains to shape society. So today, I invite you to rethink what school is about and ask yourselves, what can I do to pass on what I've learned and so help shape the brains of the next generation, and so help shape our society, and so help make my life worth the effort. Thank you so much.